Hello, everyone, and welcome to Houston House. We're happy that you could join us this afternoon. We have two sessions this afternoon, and then we end the day with a happy hour at 5.30, so make sure you stick around and join us. It is my pleasure to represent the Gr Greater Houston Partnership. I am Patty Wood, VP of Marketing uh, for Economic Development, and I get to introduce the moderator for panel number three today, and that is Stuart Core, and he is the... Director of Innovation Engineering for Houston Methodist and the Executive Director for Pumps and Pipes. Welcome, Stuart. Okay. Good. Can you hear me all? Okay, uh, so I'm going to ask my, my special guests to come up on stage. We have Trevor Best, Robin Cardwell, and Stephanie uh, Murphy. And while they're sitting in, I'm just going to say, you're going to ask, what is Pumps and Pipes? Right, it's one of Houston's oldest innovation programs. It's been around for 18 years, and it's all about convergence innovation in aerospace energy and medicine. So I'm going to take a little seat. And we've got a bunch of questions. The three questions that are posed to panelists today are basically around examples of cross-innovation, um, cross-convergence innovation. It's the specifics, so it's the strategy of how we keep doing that, and it's the talent force. So the first question that I'm going to hand off to Trevor first is give us specific examples of cross-industry collaboration how they've led to significant um, innovations. And, and potentially put in a little plug there for Houston. Why is this so uniquely Houston? Yeah, amazing. So uh, first off, really happy to be here at South by Southwest. I uh, would love to tell you all a little bit about what we do and how we've engaged with different industries across Houston. So uh, Syzygy Plasmonics is making a new type of chemical reactor. There's a lot of science behind it, uh, including like fun stuff like quantum mechanics and uh, nanophotonics, but ultimately we make a, a chemical reactor that is powered by renewable electricity. Uh, this enables us to make things like fuel, fertilizer, and a lot of the other raw chemical materials that uh, planet Earth needs without producing any carbon emissions. And so uh, we got our start uh, out of uh, Rice University. Professor Naomi Hollis and uh, Peter Nordlander. Uh, Professor Hollis runs the uh, Rice Center for uh, Laboratory for Nanophotonics and the uh, Smalley Curl Institute. Uh, they invented our technology, but it wasn't the first tech that they invented. Uh, they first applied their technology to medical science. And uh, when we were getting started, that other uh, technology being commercialized by a company called Nanospectra uh, proved pivotal to us. Uh, we actually started in their warehouse. So for the first like three years of our company, uh, we were, you know, in the back room warehouse with like lights we bought from Walmart to make sure we could see what we were doing, uh, you know, growing our startup out of a, a you know, medical company uh, in their back room. And then through the years, we've had a lot of really interesting opportunities to engage with industry. Uh, our chemical reactor uses light instead of heat. And uh, because of that, we have to build our containment out of materials that light can pass through like glass. And as we were scaling up, you know, we, we have this reactor that's got really interesting conditions and we're trying to solve how to get the metal and the glass to seal without leaking or breaking. And we're like, man, are there any other industries that have solved a problem like this before? And uh, we actually turned to the space industry. So we're like, hey, does anyone know anyone from NASA? Like, let's get some people on the phone. And we actually got somebody from the shuttle program on the phone and we're like, hey, how did you get those windows on the shuttle to seal and you know not like blow out or you know cause any problems for the astronauts? And they actually walked us through how they designed the space shuttle windows, and we took some learnings from that uh, and used that to help seal our reactor. And uh, you also asked me to give some benefits on living in Houston. Right. You know, it's not everywhere that you can you know start a chemical reactor company in a medical you know science building and you know call NASA to help solve technical problems. The kind of you know talent that we have in our ecosystem uh, gives us some really unique opportunities. You know, we've 
I, I talk to a lot of other startups from the Bay Area, from Boston, and everyone always asks me about talent. And it's been funny for us, we've never had a problem with talent. Uh, we've always been able to find like top-notch mechanical, chemical, electrical engineers, you know, to grow the company through the years. Uh, not only that, the uh, cost of, you know, starting a business in Houston, you know, if you look at how much we're paying for our facility versus other ecosystems, really, really phenomenal. It's been a great place to start a company. When it Ask Stephanie the same question. Oh, okay, Examples. thank you. Yeah, so first I'm happy to be here. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, and I, I love living and working in Houston. I've lived there most of my life. And um, I really work more in the space sector in Houston than anything, uh, but we cross over all the time. So a little bit about my company, um, just to give you some background. Uh, my dad started an engineering services firm in the early 90s. I worked there for about 15 years, and in 2015, I uh, left there to start a spin-off company to commercialize um, space testing as a service at the International Space Station. So we actually own a platform attached to the outside of the space station for um, testing materials or tech demos uh, in the harsh environment of space. Um, I came back to my dad's company. I bought him out in 2017, and in 2021, I put our two companies together, and that's how Aegis Aerospace sort of came to be. So we do government services, traditional government services. We sell a lot of engineering services to the Department of Defense and to NASA. Um, and then we have commercial testing as a service. Uh, and so that has led to a ton of crossover and a ton of examples. But one of the ones that I'd really like to touch on, uh, which, I, which is really cool for me personally, because I was uh, with it from cradle to grave, is um, in Houston and in the Bay Area in particular, there's a program called SATOP, which is the Space Alliance Technology Outreach Program. And sort of like Trevor was saying, they reached out to NASA. This, this is a program that fosters that. So SATOP connects space companies with companies across the state of Texas who have an engineering uh, challenge that they need solved. And uh, we have engineers who volunteer their time in that program all the time to help small businesses across the state uh, solve engineering challenges. And one of those challenges that we helped solve about 15 years ago was for a couple doctors at UTMB. And um, they had a process for creating these bead-based protein libraries, right? Now we're talking stuff that I really can't get into much more than that. Um, but their process took them several weeks to do, and they needed a way to make that more efficient. And so one of our engineers um, worked with them and, and engineered their process down in such a way that it could be done in a couple of hours as opposed to a couple of weeks. And he actually invented a machine uh, that helped them run these bead-based libraries. Um, so we uh, took out a patent on that. We called it Igor. And uh, we started a new company with those doctors uh, to take that technology forward and help them do that. So um, these two doctors plus UTMB, uh, who held some of the IP uh, and our engineering company, came together, formed a new company called AM Biotechnologies. Uh, we ran that for about 10 to 11 years, um, progressing the science and um, had some great grants, brought a lot of funding in, and it helped that uh, that program was, you know, sponsored by UTMB, the IP was held by UTMB, and the medical center in Houston was a great place for us to uh, do additional research and bring in funding. We ended up selling that to, uh, or the majority of that company in 2019 to Fannin Innovation Group, which is another innovation group that's a hub in Houston uh, run by Leo Limbeck uh, for uh, innovating things like this. And so, they're taking these aptamers um, to the next level for diagnostics and drug usage. And uh, it's just a really cool example of how our engineers who work on space every day had a chance to sort of cross over into another industry. We made a whole other business out of it. And uh, they're moving forward with some clinical trials, I believe, in the next year or two. So that's an example. Um, I kind of plugged Houston all along the way, right, as I was going, because it's just a great place to be. and. Uh, it's also a friendly city, right? There is competition and there's these crossover from industries. And a lot of work that we do for NASA um, and JSC is on the manned uh, or human space flight sector, right? Uh, JSC is sort of known as the home of the astronauts. And we do a lot of work around um, the care and feeding of the astronauts. We support a contract at NASA. Um, and so we have PhDs and um, 
you know, epidemiologists to sound technicians to food technicians. And a lot of our employees cross over and actually are employed either by academia in the area or they do work um, in the medical center as well. And that keeps them up to date and keeps it enriched. And it's a friendly environment to do that. Um, there's not, there is, you know, there's poaching that happens and people jump jobs and jump industries. But there's many more opportunities for our employees to cross over and work together in those other industries. That's one thing I really appreciate about Houston. It's very unique, that. <coughs> uh, Robin? Sure. So, um, Robin Cardwell. So, I'm representing OmniScience, which um, formerly known as Mercury Data Science, is a Houston-born and Houston-incubated company. We are a life science-focused data analytics, AI, and machine learning shop. So we have products and services that really support our clients. Actually, in various industries, we've recently focused on life sciences, but really um, focusing on like biomarker discovery, development, and progression, um, precision diagnostic space, and then digital health technology. So all the data that's coming out of all these new technologies that are being generated, you know, how do you find great signal in that to really help clinical trial development and, and therapeutic advancement? Uh, this, I'm really excited about this panel, so I'm a biomedical engineer. I feel like we're the engineering panel at some, we're all engineering companies. Um, and I actually chose many years ago to be in biomedical engineering because of the intersection of multiple industries and collaborations together, so this is a very fitting panel. Um, so after grad school, I actually went to the Bay Area um, and spent a number of years working with um, startups in the oncology um, precision diagnostic space. Um, we don't need to get into the details, but using my engineering background to scale the laboratories there, like how do you automate the laboratory processes? How do you automate the data analytics that are happening in those labs as we are as the, you know, the, the world is asking for more precision-based <clears throat> diagnostics. So uh, spent six years in the Bay Area, then actually moved to Austin and spent five years here and understanding and, and gaining experience in the SaaS and digital transformation space because you know, Austin has a great hub for that. Um, and recently moved to uh, Houston about two, maybe three years ago. Um, and it was partly a decision because um, with my life science and medical background, there's so much in Houston where, you know, I have the opportunity professionally to grow and career and like at OmniScience and a number of other organizations um, within the life sciences because of our Texas Medical Center and other things there. Um, but then my, my other half, I guess, is in the aerospace industry. And so Houston was a great place for us as a family to move and be able to work with both of our careers and have places to kind of continue to grow and, and interact with, with great people like we have here. Um, so I moved to Houston um, with a, a, a job working for ABB, um, which if you don't know ABB, it's a large global industrial technology organization that has a, a robotics arm. And they chose Houston as the um, global hub for their healthcare and life sciences organization. And so I was a part of that, of helping grow that there because they had access to so many different life sciences um, opportunities. Uh, Stuart and I actually worked together on a, a pharmacy innovation project at Houston Methodist, putting a collaborative robot inside, a, um, inside the pharmacy where there's a need to take some of the load off of the nurses, to use robotics and vision to, to be able to like decrease some of the workload that's happening there. Um, so that to me is like the first example that I had of the collaboration in Houston is this very large industrial automation robotics group saying, hey, life science is where it's at in Houston. We want to merge together and, and really bring that to be. Wonderful. Um, Trevor, I'm going to ask you something. So you originally worked for Oxy, was it? Oil and gas? Baker Hughes. Baker Hughes, wrong one, right? Um, but you said you got out of that and you purposely wanted to form a startup company and you went looking for technology which eventually sourced at Rice. So what led you to Rice? Why not another university, another IP center? Yeah, so uh, we you know, did a technology search where we, uh, well, a little bit about my background before I get into this. So uh, at Baker Hughes, uh, I was working in the R&D center and my co-founder, Dr. Suman Kadiwada and I uh, were part of the product development process. 
And between the two of us, we were involved in more than 100 product development projects. So we, you know, this is like early stage R&D. We got a good feel for like things that worked and <laughs> things that didn't. Uh, we started a search, you know, using this experience. Uh, we identified a set of characteristics that we were looking for. We were looking Stanford, MIT, you know, Berkeley, et cetera. And of course, Rice University was on that list. And uh, you know, one of the main reasons was, you know, he was a PhD that came out of Rice, but uh, Rice is actually one of the stronger universities across the U.S. in terms of, like, fundamental science. And uh, what we saw was that there wasn't nearly the same push in Rice to commercialize that technology as there was in other universities at that time. This was 2016, 2017. So we kind of viewed Rice as a very ripe place. There was a lot of interesting tech there that wasn't getting you know, taken into the market. So I uh, started talking to the professors and eventually decided to license our tech and uh, take it out. Since then, uh, there's been a lot of changes uh, at Rice. You know, New leadership uh, under the uh, new university president, uh, Reggie DeRoach, you know, and uh, for those of you <clears throat> familiar with Rice, you know, the Office of Innovation under Paul Chair Curry, uh, they have been doing a huge push to completely revamp Rice's uh, approach to commercializing new technology. And so they have, you know, the Clean Energy Accelerator, the Rice Alliance is taking a more prominent role in another one of their deployments, the ION, they have uh, Lilly Labs, which is, uh, you know, they have a program there to help encourage entrepreneurship where they're giving grants to PhDs to spend like a certain amount of their time to try and commercialize their technology. And uh, I think that Rice is uh, on the cusp of becoming one of the main universities right behind you know, MIT and Stanford in commercializing its tech. Gonna take a couple years, but there's a lot of good writing on the wall there. But uh, it's not just the university, it's also the greater ecosystem. There is a revolution starting to happen in Houston right now. And if you go back to when Syzygy started, you know, one of the first like, companies a couple years ago really trying to pull tech out of rice, uh, but uh, in the Houston ecosystem, there wasn't that much going on. You had uh, the uh, you know, HTC, which is the Houston Technology Center. You had another organization called Start Houston. Uh, we were talking this morning, like across one year, there were like two or three you know, groups trying to come together and make things happen. If you look now, there is so much more happening. There is Greentown Labs, there is the ION, there is Activate, there is, you know, uh, TMCX, there is J Labs, there is, uh, yeah, there's Halliburton Labs. There's so, so many things like starting to bubble up in Houston. And uh, I think the ecosystem is getting to a point of critical mass. There's gonna be some like, you know, pick up, slow down, you know, we are tied to the energy industry, which is cyclical, but uh, I think all in all, the signs are pointing towards a lot of success in the future in Houston. The one thing though that Houston really needs is a big win. Uh, many other ecosystems have like a cohort of companies that went on to like not only go unicorn, but become huge companies. If you look at Silicon Valley, you know, uh, you know, not only are there the you know, semiconductor companies that you know, got, the name, got it the name Silicon Valley, but you know, later on you've got the FANG companies, Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Google, coming out of Silicon Valley. In Boston, you've got the biotech companies. Uh, Houston hasn't had that big cohort of startups exiting yet, but I think we're not far off because like 10, 15 years ago, there weren't companies like Aegis Aerospace, you know, OmniScience and Syzygy like really getting up to speed in the ecosystem. And now there's a lot of things up and coming. So I think we're just on the cusp of something really huge for the ecosystem. Yep, totally agree. Um, when you find a technology from Naomi Hallis, Pete Nolander, you know, they probably IP'd that or created that, what, about mid-2000s? Late uh, 90s. The, the core tech behind Syzygy first published in 2016. So, so I'm going some of this, right? So you know, Trevor's told you about, okay, your starting point was finding that tech at Rice, uh, just you know, for a little bit. But what happened before that? And it's really important in a historical context. Does anyone know what happened at Rice in 1985? 
a big discovery was made that led to a Nobel Prize, right? They discovered a new form of carbon in the labs. It was called C60, fullerene, okay? Buckyballs. Buckyballs, all the way. And this directly led from a kind of cross-pollination, cross-industry collaboration where you had one gentleman in the UK that was basically trying to look at different types of carbon clusters in space, different molecules, okay? And he was looking for a new way to study that. And then he heard about a guy called Rick Smalley at Rice who was doing semiconductor physics and had very unique laser vaporization methods. And then the guy in the middle, um, Bob Curl, can introduce them, right? So they were essentially creating space dust in the lab and he kept getting this peak, this peak that was popping out, 60, 60, 60, and they're like, go away, peak, just go away. We're trying to look over here. Kept getting this peak. And under certain conditions, you'd get even more of that peak. So they realized, hang on, this isn't an artifact. We're getting something. We're creating something here. And they realized that the only thing it could be is a soccer-shaped form of carbon. That led to Nobel Prize. And if you see the publication, it was beautiful. It was a one-page publication to Nature that had a little picture of the experiment set up and one picture of mass spec with this big peak. Boom. Where I'm going with this is that launched nanotechnology at Rice, okay? And they had to pull in money, more funding, to allow these new instruments to, to be developed, to start analyzing and discovering things at the nano scale. That only happened through aerospace funding, through medical funding, and um, through energy funding. So you have you know, labs like Pete Nolanders and Naomi Hallis who had multiple applications for that one technology, but it all stemmed from this discovery. And it's now leading to these companies. And there's another company that I believe um, Naomi Hallis and Pete Norlander have, and it was at Nanospectrum. Mm -hmm. And they've done the first um, like human trials. It's, it's prostate cancer therapy with light activated gold nanoparticles. You may wonder, well, where's gold nanoparticles in the world? They're in COVID test kits, right? So a lot of the laminar RNA therapeutics, you know, the, the test kits that you take, it's gold nanoparticles, it all came from rice. And a second thing about, you know, the, the hospitality, Houston, and ability to innovate multi-industry multi, um, is, you talk about ABB project. So Robin and I didn't even realize that we actually worked on it at different times. So when I joined Houston Methodist 2020, I tried to get ABB Robotics in, and we went on a, a kind of like a problem solving, like ex, you know, exhibit, whatever. We went into pharmacy. There's a big group of us, we literally just walked in and trying to look at problems. We had a couple lined up. So I sat in the back to kind of do what I do, right? And I was just watching. And there was one lady in particular, she seemed very nosy, all right? She was like, what? what's happening here? What's going on? And I just looked at her, I was like, okay, she's the person I need to talk to, because she's going to know exactly where the problems are. I went up, had a little conversation. She's like, you looking for problems? I got one right here. <laughs> I can't tell you what the problem is, because there's a bit of IP stuff. But right there, right then, she took us that problem, which has now led to a contract in place to actually demonstrate a proof of concept between ABB Robotics and a health institute such as Houston Methodist. And I really do feel it's only Houston, that environment where those kind of collision interactions can take place. Now, going on to the second question is about strategies. So what strategies can we implement in Houston to allow these kind of things to occur? And you know, Trevor kind of uh, talked about that somewhat with what they're doing at Rice. Um, so, Stephanie, would you like to comment on that? Like, what strategies can be utilized in Houston to let more of this knowledge share and more of this collaboration to take place? Yeah, I can comment on it. I, I don't know that I have the, the full answer to that, but one of the things um, that we're trying to do, and when I say Bay Area, I don't mean California, I mean, you know, the Clear Lake area um, of Houston. Um, but our economic development group, uh, BayHEP there, is, is really in a a new leadership um, forum, and they're partnering like with Greater Houston Partnership now in a way that they never have before. And I think we're trying to bring the messaging together across the city and honestly across the state, um, especially around the space industry for me. You know, that's the lens that I look through um, in a way that we never have before. So there's some exciting things happening in our part of Houston, and we're trying uh, really diligently to 
map out strategies um, among some of the development groups in the city so that everybody's, one, aware of what's going on, right? There's a new Space Institute coming in. There's some new legislation forming a space commission and a space consortium. Uh, the spaceport is up and going. Uh, Venus Aerospace is up and going at Ellington. Ellington used to be on the BRAC list. It's no longer doing that. There are so many things going on in our area. And then just the co commercial space companies um, are taking off at a new velocity and bringing a lot of funding into the area and a lot of jobs into the area. And I don't know that that message gets communicated across all of the other um, industries in Houston. So we're working really hard um, as a smaller group in the local Clear Lake area to try to partner with GHP um, and get better messaging. And w one example of how we're doing that, the Space Symposium is sort of the uh, big conference for space. It's coming up in Colorado in a couple of weeks. And it's the first time I've seen several companies come together in different parts of the space um, ecosystem to put together a unified message about Houston and why Houston's a great place to be um, and why Houston is a place where new startups should be uh, when, they're, when they're thinking about where they're going to locate. So um, that's one example from my, um, from my little corner of the world in Houston, how we're trying to do that better. And, and maybe just continuing on that, you know, why is Houston the place to go in terms of funding? Because behind all these strategies, you've got to have the funding, the money to implement these strategies. So the people with the funds must realize there must be like a good return on investment. So is Houston at critical mass in terms of aerospace? Or is it getting there? Yeah, no, I think Houston has a critical mass in terms of aerospace. JSC is very friendly to... JSC is the home of opening up space commercialization. They started um, at the ISS with commercial crew and commercial cargo, which people hear about pretty often, right? Private astronauts going to the space station or Northrop Grumman or uh, SpaceX taking cargo on a private mission. The other thing that they've done, which isn't so well known, is they've opened up for commercial service providers. So there's about a dozen providers of services at the space station who own their own little piece of the space station. It's not a NASA-owned asset, um, and that's what our asset is. Our, we call it MISI. It's a facility attached to the outside of the space station. Totally commercial. So um, we do let NASA use part of it for testing, but you don't have to be a NASA scientist to utilize a space station anymore. The, they've really opened up the thinking on that, and we can sell space to private industry, to startups, to private um, people. Um, on a commercial basis um, and, and help provide those services turnkey. So there are biological resources. Um, ours happens to be outside, you know, testing tech demos materials. There's commercial service providers inside the space station who provide um, research for pharmaceuticals, for biologicals. I was talking to Robin about, you know, they've just done some 3D printing of um, heart cells mm. and um, tissues on space station, and those are all um, levied by these commercial service providers. Um, and I, you know, JSC is the only NASA center across the country who's really opened up commercialization um, at NASA. So I think they're at a forerunner there. There's a great critical mass, too, of these private commercial um, space companies who are coming together to build the next commercial space station, right? Space station is only going to be there. Uh, five, six more years, uh, maybe a little bit longer, if you're like me and hopeful. Um, but uh, there's a tremendous amount of investment for um, commercialization around low Earth orbit, and uh, the applications um, are just the ripple effect of the applications of the science being done there is <clears throat> opening up space to, to partners who never had access before. No. So I think critical mass is maybe an understatement. <laughs> Wonderful. I may be biased. <laughs> uh, Robin, you like your comment? Yeah, I'll, I'll uh, take that from the life science uh, colored glasses. Um, so you're talking a lot about the aerospace and life sciences and doing the experiments um, on the space station. And there's organizations in Houston already, like Trish, which is a Baylor College of Medicine with NASA that's <coughs> facilitating some of that as well. It's like, how do we both improve you know, astronaut health, but also like health of humans back on this planet? Um, and there's a lot of like amazing advances and things that are coming out that it's, it's just hard to keep up with even on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so in Houston, it seems like there's so much happening. Um, I think we were all talking this morning and like we, we learned something new this morning just between the four of us of like what's happening and what 
co you know, what combination of things are happening and what, what conversations have happened. Um, I was reminded of, you know, the East End, there's an East End Maker Hub, which kind of helps these, you know, disparate industries sort of collaborate, like when your company started, you know, there was a company there that does 3D printing, um, Volumetric, who actually recently got acquired by 3D Systems, which is a large materials printing organization that bought Volumetric, which is a Houston-based, but they were like alongside a robotic inspection vehicle manufacturer at this Maker Hub. So, it's not, you know, life science isn't only at the TMC, it's kind of around all of Houston. Um, and then Houston also has understood the, the need in this, in this country to bring biomanufacturing back on shore. So there's new initiatives for biomanufacturing like at Generation Park, which is on the, the northeast side of Houston. So again, not all the TMC, there's other areas where Houston has the space to grow. So not just startups, but how do we grow and manufacture for the biomanufacturing era that needs to come back here as well. Um, there's small privately or owned engineering services companies where you know those engineers are very well trained across multiple industries, whether it's aerospace, life science, um, semiconductors, things like that. So supporting either some of the startups or some of the um, academic centers to be able to give more, um, I guess, you know, keep moving things forward as these innovations go. Um, and then to talk about the data that's coming out of whether it's aerospace or biotech or wherever, now we are in this like data revolution as well. And there are companies and you know the need and the expertise within Houston to really um, start capitalizing and trying to find the value that's coming out of all that data. Um, I'm sure Houston Methodist is sitting on treasure troves of data where there may be an amazing innovation there if we can just kind of take a look under the hood and kind of see what's happening. Um, one thing I'll say kind of to your funding question or comment was, you know, in this world of AI and machine learning, you may not always know what you're gonna get. Like, it's hard to calculate and say what the ROI is gonna be at the end of this experiment with your data. You just kind of have to like look and see and try. Um, traditionally, life science and, and healthcare has been a bit risk adverse, in, as so to speak. Um, and so I think Houston is, <coughs> Houston leaders and Houston um, kind of having that oil and energy background that's less risk adverse, that's willing to go drill into a potential uh, gold mine of, of oil can bring in that attitude back to the life science space. I think there's a critical mass there to maybe make that transition, which for life sciences would be huge because I think for funding, that's really what's gonna drive some of these like moonshots and really challenging problems. So I think what you're hearing is there's a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> I mean, it's almost overwhelming. And to be honest, if it wasn't for Innovation Map, and I see Natalie Harms is here, if it wasn't for Innovation Map, which every single day post publishes a kind of what's going on in Houston innovation, I would be lost. I mean, 7 a.m. every day on the button, boom. So sign up to that, but it's phenomenal. Um, you know, you're talking about like, you know, what, what strategies can be implemented to promote knowledge sharing. And one of the things we've done at Houston Methodist is, you probably don't know this, but Houston Methodist provides medical services to Axiom Space. They're like, they're the key medical provider, okay? So, so from that, I started speaking with the Axiom Space folk. Um, I think Mike Harrison is their, their chief medical officer. And, you know, just really kind of organic conversation saying, hey, you know, Mike, what are you guys looking at? What are you wanting to do? And, and there seems to be not just Axiom Space, but, you know, through Trish as well, this unilateral need for this extended reality applications, right? So augmented reality. How do you do surgery in space with a time lag, with a latency there, with minimal tools, right? And it naturally opens itself open to, to artificial intelligence, to AI, et cetera. Um, so you find, like, just through those... I, I mean, I guess it's an undefined strategy, but just by having a strategy in the first place of Axiom Space and Houston Methodist, it leads to these organic, serendipitous discoveries, right? Um, getting back to Houston, there was the colleague of mine, Mark Hannigan, who I thought described Houston perfectly last year. He said, Houston's the type of person where you're at a bar and you say, here, hold my beer, I got this, right? And that's a real nice ethos kind of spirit Houston, it's like, hey, I've got this, right? 
We're giving it I'm Scottish and giving it my buddy Scottish as well. There's a little bit of competition there. I said, all right, man. All right, well, let's do something, all right? So we actually went out and created this Datapreneur and Health program, which is based at Houston Methodist Hospital. Brand new. Natalie, I've not even told you about this yet, so I'll tell you in the future. So Datapreneur and Health, because like the <coughs> oil and gas folk, the last 100 plus years, the wildcatters, right? We want to mine that data. We want to be able to put money in looking for this data. So with this structure, we want to be able to, you know, people like OmniScience work on building that framework so that we can come along and mine that data. Because we are, it's beyond a trove of like wealth. It's, it's going to lead to new discoveries as well in science, which is really incredible. I mean, that's, that's my kind of view anyway. Um, so just kind of tying off the last question, it's people power, right? It's all about people, and Trevor, you said it very clearly this morning. It's all about people, right? No matter what industry, no matter who you're working with, relationships, people, okay? So how, you know, how, how can Houston attract um, the right people, um, and how can we develop this cross-disciplinary innovation to, to keep this innovation machine going? I mean, innovation is the game that never ends. So any thoughts on that, Trevor? Yeah, sure. So Houston has a cornucopia of opportunity for people looking to switch industries. And uh, this is because of, you know, the nature of the different industries that, that show up in Houston. There's a lot of overlap. So like we just talked about, like general engineering, like a lot of the principles that are used in aerospace can also be applied to the energy industry. Like you're getting into medical devices, you need engineering there as well. And so uh, there is a lot of opportunity for people to switch industries. Like in Syzygy, you know, we've got people who come from the medical industry. We've got people who come from aerospace, you know, and bring skills like project management and, uh, you know, other things. So, like, it's funny because uh, we're actually using, uh, you know, agile processes to help develop our reactor, which is typically used for software. And so uh, lots and lots of opportunity in Houston. And not only that, just the diversity of our talent pool. Uh, I, I hear a lot that Houston is like, the most diverse ecosystem in the United States. And I really think that that's one of our superpowers. It, you know, the you know, nature of the city and how it brings international uh, players to come like participate in our medical industry, uh, to come participate in the energy industry, like brings a lot of new ideas. And uh, I think this is one of the strongest things, uh, you know, in Houston. It's something that we really focus on. Stephanie, late comment. Yeah, um, sort of like Trevor said, I think it's easy for people to, to uh, find their place across different industries and not just jump industry industry but straddle them also so um, even though we're in space we do a lot of uh, aerospace engineering uh, we love hiring engineers and uh, managers out of oil and gas in particular um, they come with a different um, pace than we're used to in sort of government contracting world uh, they have great commercial practices great work ethic and, um, you know, two of our key people uh, from oil and gas, uh, our chief strategy officer and one of our vice presidents over our hardware development. And he in particular has brought some engineering perspectives to what we do in space um, that we wouldn't have had the benefit of otherwise. And um, his experience was um, operating uh, remote operated vehicles in, in subsea environments super harsh environments, um, you know, not able to have human access to those environments. Mm -hmm. And he took some of the designs for some of those ROVs uh, for the robotic interfaces and helped us apply those to things that we're doing in space where super harsh environment can't have access to astronauts doing EVAs all the time. Um, and so we needed robotic access. And it helped us uh, bring to market a more efficient um, robotic interface for uh, changing out our science carriers on our facility. And we wouldn't have had that if he hadn't uh, crossed over to our company. Um, but also, we have employees who straddle, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but um, we have an employee, for example, who helps support um, the human health and performance work at JSC. That's work that helps take care of the astronauts. Um, and she also is a, 
a director of an aquatics lab at the University of Houston. So she gets to, she's academia, PhD, she gets to sort of straddle and do a little bit of both, where she's helping the astronauts um, and take care of the, the health systems for them. But she's also still got a foot in academia, uh, running a lab at the University of Houston. And we have that from time to time. We have people who straddle medical center projects uh, while they're also doing work uh, for NASA. Um, so it's a really unique place where employees get the opportunities to do that. Um, I don't think that you could find that many other places in the country. No. And it's important having those kind of cross-industry networks, right? If you want to try and recruit like new PhDs, new students, you kind of, you got your ear at the ground, you're understanding yeah. who's coming up, et cetera. And, and Robin, you like comment? Yeah, absolutely. I'll kind of second, third, everything you've been saying. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it is very true that Houston is the most, one of the most diverse cities I've lived in. Um, it, it's amazing, not just from like who, but like you have, you know, the Rice and other um, organizations that are, you know, graduating new PhDs in all these fields. But then there's also like technical, more technical colleges and things like that where, you know, technicians and engineers that may need to, you know, have worked in the oil and gas industry before, maybe in more in a manufacturing setting, you know, kind of providing training opportunities to, to maybe tweak what they already know in like the process side or the manufacturing for like a biological manufacturing setting is important because bringing those skill sets to like a life science organization where all of a sudden you need to make, you know, however one liter, but now you need to make, you know, 30 liters seems like a lot in life sciences, but to oil and gas, that's like nothing like that. That's tiny. Um, so I think there's diversity in both the industries that folks have coming from and also the um, sort of experience and expertise that they have. Um, you know, I will speak a little bit on the, the data side of things. So, so data can be broken down into, you know, various types. So time series data. Um, if you pair a data scientist with a domain expert, you can really make some amazing predictive analytics on that time series data. Well, how can you use time series data like from an oil and gas um, drilling operation and it, there's some similar techniques that can be used there so as long as you have a little bit of domain expertise to to really capitalize on the tools and techniques that are available these days um, you can really uh, gr do some amazing innovations and, and grow there so I really think Houston has kind of all these pieces put together we have domain we have the manufacturing side we have the process side we have all the engineering technicians so we can kind of put all the pieces together for growing, scaling organizations. Yeah. And, and it, it's not just all the, the technical um, background as well. I mean, you know, when we're hiring at Houston Methodist, there's, there's a lot of like customer service that goes on, right? So the first thing I ask whoever I'm bringing, even for engineers, I say, have you ever worked in a bar? Have you ever worked in a restaurant? And if they say no, I'm like, okay, it's not bad. But there's a lot to be said for people that have really good customer skills, like be able to handle people and work with people because it is all about people at the end of the day. So given that Houston is one of the best, biggest restaurant scenes in America, there's a lot of people that have been in that service industry, all right, that are maybe working in a restaurant when they're going to university college. So there's a lot to be said for that, I think. And given that it's such an international headquarters, I mean, you, you know, we touched on this earlier, there's a lot of diversity of thought, okay? You've got a lot of people coming in from different countries, they've been educated differently, they just see the world and think about the world in a different way. And that's critical sometimes to, to shift the needle innovation. You can't innovate a room full of people that are all from the same background and educated the same. Just in my opinion, it doesn't work. Right, so now's the even more fun part is the audience Q and A. I know everyone's itching to ask questions. Quick question to you guys though. Um, put your hand up if you're from Austin, you currently live in Austin. And same question, but for Houston. All right, and then everyone else. <laughs> Who wants to relocate to Houston? <laughs> if anyone re relocates Houston, I will give you the contents of my wallet, which is five bucks. <laughs> and I've got three dollars in HEB buddy bucks as well. You have family. <laughs> um, so yes, I'd love to invite the audience to come up for Q&A. If you just like to make your way to the microphone, say who you are and we'll try and answer your question. Uh, 
I've been waiting for this for the whole session, just in case anybody wondered. Um, but no, my name is uh, Wesley Owens. I'm with Banjag Solutions. We are uh, Blue Collar Tech, uh, founded in College Station, Texas, which of course is, is right on the doorstep of, of Houston. Um, we're about three years old. We just passed our, our third anniversary, and uh, we've had a lot of success early on. We've gotten uh, one million in ARR in the first 24 months. Uh, we just passed into profitability one month ago, so we're really, really excited about that. Um, but it's been very, very challenging. Uh, one of the issues that we've run into is being in College Station, uh, connections are really, really challenging for us. And when you're talking about people, you're talking about what's happening in Houston and all of this innovation, these connections that are going on. Uh, we're about equal distance out of Dallas, Houston, and Austin. We're considered as being part of kind of Houston, mm -hmm. but we're finding it hard to make connections there. So what would you recommend for us uh, as we continue to grow and to develop to, to really take part uh, in the community that's building there? I think you need to relocate to Houston. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I would, there's a couple of organizations that do a really good job of helping like connect and spread the word. So uh, in, if you're in energy, you know, in Houston, you've got Greentown Labs and the ION, I would, uh, you know, at least send someone there to their events, you know, once a month, once every other month. In uh, Austin and Dallas, you've got Capital Factory. Mm -hmm. uh, Capital Factory has some presence in, in Houston as well. And uh, I'm not quite sure in Dallas, but those are some of the best like networking organizations if you're just looking to meet people. Gotcha. Thank you so much. Sure. Any other suggestions? Well, I mean, I you know, sort of jumping on what Trevor said, I think you need to find the opportunities for networking. So I love College Station. I'm an Aggie twice over. Big and uh, and I'm in College Station all the time. But um, it de you're right. It doesn't have the network built into the College Station infrastructure for maybe the type of growth that you need. I think there are several organizations. Um, and, and, you know, a little plug for GHP. That's a great place to start um, because they can help you sort of splinter out into other organizations. It just sort of depends what you want to do. But um, I think there's no shortage of um, opportunity, conferences, associations in Houston that maybe you could get connected to, but you have to show up um, because you have to build those relationships. It's, you know, people do business with people um, and companies, you know, it's people who are doing business with people. Um, so you got to show up and, and uh, and be a little bit engaged, I'd say, or have somebody be engaged uh, to make a difference. But there's no shortage of opportunity to do that in Houston. Um, I, I would say GHP is maybe a good place to start. Yeah. Like, like definitely get on Greater Houston Partnership newsletters. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I mentioned earlier, but Innovation Map has a daily newsletter as well. It's, it's a daily digest of everything that's going on. Um, so I think once you find your network, you just ping them. Don't <coughs> stop, just kind of build that up. Perfect. Um, yeah, and as a new person to Houston, I find I found Houston to be very welcoming. Like, talk to anybody. I mean, I went to Greentown Labs as a life science person and just started talking, and I met some really great people. And so people are very friendly, um, which I think is amazing, and just happy to talk about what's what they're up to and things like that. So, yeah, there's so much going on, though, for sure. Perfect. Well, thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you for the question. Hi guys, great talk. My name is Jess Ferrari. I work for the City of Austin's Economic Development Department. Um, you guys shared a lot of examples of sort of innovation from cross-industry collaboration, and that was really cool to see. Uh, what role, if any, um, can city governments play in sort of supporting this type of collaboration across industries? Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Um, well, we have, at least on the life science side, we have a lot of state support on like the secret side of things. But Houston, you know, providing the space, providing, you know, Greater Houston Partnership, I believe is part of the. Yeah. Yeah, so. It's, so, so from my experience, um, I think being aware of what issues that the local government and governance structure are going after is, is critical, all right? You know, I think in Houston, you have Jesse Rios is the, the um, Chief Innovation Officer for the you know the, the city of Houston. I went to one of his um, talks and they were talking about flood mitigation, you know, flood prevention control. It was after Hurricane Harvey, 
Um, and that was very clear to understand, okay, what are they doing? They're, they're expanding the, the bayous. Um, they are potentially looking at new tech from rice to look at flood levels based on optical cameras. So, you know, for any innovator in that room, any technologist, as soon as they hear these problems, their brain just starts going, all right? You just can't turn it off. So, you know, the, the more ways you actually disseminate that information to the public, I think the better. You know, have it written down, have it on your website, just have it there. Um, it's really important. And, and for Houston, I'm going to say it, I said it today, they've got to get the train sorted out, man, right? <laughs> It, what I mean by that is right through the heart of Houston, they've got big train tracks. They run big freight trains. But they run them at 8 a.m. in the morning. They run them at 4 or 5 p.m. in the evening when you've got 120,000 people driving just to the Texas Medical Center. Like the, the Medical Center is the eighth biggest business district in the U.S. Okay? And they're talking about, oh, yeah, we're going to build TMC3. We're going to add 40,000 jobs. We're going to build this bioport, another 50,000 jobs. And, and there's me putting my hand up and saying, well, what are you going to do about traffic? Yeah. Nothing, right? Th that's room for innovation right there. But they've got, to get, like, they've got to get the train sorted. They've got to get the traffic sorted. Vent over. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think something that could be very good is if you're very intentional about the types of innovations you're looking for and, like, put out a call. You know, like, hey, the city of Austin is going to like adopt some new technology in this area and we've set money aside from it and we're going to preferentially select, you know, a startup or something from our ecosystem to do that. And uh, it needs to be something that's not so critical that if, you know, like you, you probably don't want to like, you know, do the uh, like flood prevention on the bayou with like some startup who's never deployed technology before because Houston really needs that to work. But, uh, but other things like, uh, you know, the way uh, there was one startup that was like looking at how like metro buses communicated with each other and like the connectivity there and how they could like track and manage their routes and like turn it into an app that people could use, uh, you know things like that. Just be very intentional about it. Put the call out there and uh, you know see who responds. Yeah, and just one more thing to add there is um, work with the school districts as well. And, and where I'm going with this is if you put something out there saying hey. I want all these kids to do a school project. That filters up to the parents, all right? So you're indirectly then disseminating what you need to the entire city. I mean, that's why Pumps and Pipes does a lot of work with Houston Independent School District, HISD, because of that reason. It's like, if you want to get a message out there, we do it as an interact and interaction with the, the high schools, for example, or the elementary schools. Yeah, and just as a note, when I say put out the call, like go tell Capital Factory, tell the University of Texas, like the entrepreneurship schools, you know, those networking groups where people yeah. show up. Okay, thank you. Next question. Hey, we're very happy to have the chance to speak with you guys. I think it's, uh, it's pretty amazing that we can pick up your brain for free. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very inspired about that. So I'm an HR director for OCI Global. I don't know if you heard about them. We're in Beaumont, Texas. And right now we're struggling to find talent in manufacturing. So I wanted to ask you what creative way, and I'm really emphasizing on the word creative way have you used in your career to find top talent? Because my team and I, we're kind of struggling right now to not only attract talent in Beaumont, but also retain them. And I think especially in the industry that you guys are in, it's, uh, it's a challenge that you may or may not experience depending on the talent that you have in your team. But I kind of wanted to see what creative way have you used in the past or currently to tackle that challenge. Thank you. So, so just so I got the question correct, are you asking how the city of Beaumont can um, attract talent and keep the talent there? Right. Uh, how you can attract talent and retain them. And okay. what creative way have you used to do that? Creative way have you used to do that? Create more avenues. Okay. Well, um, one suggestion for that. Did you say you were in Beaumont? Is that correct. what you said? Correct. Beaumont, Texas. Correct. Um, is partner with your local city and your local university or uh, a good example, Dr. Hellier's here, but San Jacinto Community College has an edge center, for example, and they uh, got a grant um, and they work and they communicate with all the local aerospace companies there, uh, but they got a grant to do education training for aerospace technicians specifically. 
and they partner these techs um, with these companies so they get hands-on experience while they're going through their certification program. And they've come to us and said, hey, what is the talent that you need and that you're missing? And then they go and they develop their curriculum around it um, to help provide this um, new pipeline of tech talent. It's, it's technical trade. Um, and they did that in coordination um, through the, our local economic development group where they have access to all the aerospace companies that are there. They have access to all the local city governments um, attend those events. Um, they have access to other academia um, are at those events. And I think it's been a pretty effective uh, program. It's just sort of, I think, taking off. Um, but that's one way maybe to partner with uh, your local government and a local school and go after some grant money to get the kind of training that you need um, to help build that pipeline. Mm -hmm. that's, that's one suggestion. Thank you. Uh, um, I mean, I, I agree that it's like building the pipeline, but then I think, I don't know if you're looking for like experienced manufacturing people as well. So there's, there's the early stage, but then also the experience. Um, I, I mean, I don't know if I have the solution, but I know that this, you know, the remote, the hybrid working is a very much a, cha a challenge, especially in the manufacturing <coughs> when you need to be hands-on. So, um, but retaining talent and making sure that they're in like great places to live and like providing benefits that may not always be salary. I know this is a whole conversation to open up, but um, you know, data scientists just coming from our side is that is a very hot field right now and very challenging to uh, maintain and keep those people engaged and, and working. Um, so we have other benefits that allow our scientists to you know kind of have independent projects and be innovative themselves and have a lot of autonomy. So. Um, I don't know if I have the solution, but like, may, but I like your, you know, feed the pipeline, partner to get the pipeline fed, but then also, you know, thinking about what, what the needs are for your organization in a place that may not have so many, and maybe being creative um, in non-traditional ways. That's something that I always think about is uh, like when you're talking about talent, you got to think about the value that your organization or the employer is providing. And uh, like when you're thinking about the value that you're giving your employees, you're, you're doing one of two things. You're either filling their heart or you're filling their wallet, or both if, if you're a really great place to work. But uh, like filling the heart, like Syzygy is a mission-driven company. You might see the, the Syzygy shoes. We buy everyone a pair of the kicks because we walk this path together. You know, we are here to like help fight climate change, prevent a gigaton of carbon emissions. And so like the reason for our being is that we want to make a better future. And that kind of mission will attract a certain kind of people around it. One of the reasons that we've never struggled for talent is there's a lot of people who want to be part of something bigger and fight for a better future. And so that's like filling the heart. Uh, the other thing is like uh, if you have a, you know, organization that doesn't isn't really mission driven and it's just like bottom line profit then you you got to fill people's wallets and pay them well if you want them to stick around yep. and so like for the the companies that you are trying to help attract and retain talent like you know think about it are they you know mission driven are they providing benefits above and beyond just salary and if not like are they paying better than than someone else can pay somewhere else uh, because if they aren't mission driven and there's no reason beyond money to work there and they're not paying well, then they're going to have problems attracting and retaining talent. Okay. One last question, Natalie. Hi, um, and Stuart, thank you so much for the Innovation Map shout outs. But um, <coughs> one thing that kept sticking with me through this fabulous panel um, was the note on Houston not yet having its big win. Because I've heard that a lot, and it seems crazy when we talk about Houston's legacy industries um, having such major activity, major corporations involved. Um, I'm wondering what's the definition of having a big win in the year 2024? Because you mentioned volumetric exiting before it could like grow big enough and then have that big win. You know, it seems like some of the good companies get scooped up earlier on in this day and age, and also like. IPOs are more rare. So what's a big win for Houston? I mean, I think it's uh, an IPO with uh, an industry-making company. 
you know, like we talked about the Fang companies, you, you look at like Tesla with electric vehicles, uh, like we need some Houston company to IPO and become, you know, a disruptor or a market maker. And, you know, I mean, there was Compaq back in the day, but I, I am not sure who that name is. We got, we got industry out the wazoo, you know, we got Chevron, Exxon, we got, you know, TMC, we got some really big players, but uh, none of them are viewed as like uh, early stage, you know, through to exit type companies. So I think we need someone to start all the way through IPO and fundamentally change a market to really put Houston on the map. That, that would be my guess. Uh, and it's not that, that the Houston economy needs a big win. I mean, Houston's like doing fine <laughs> uh, economically. It's just the innovation ecosystem needs a big win. Yeah, I mean, I mean personally, I, I just like to see a tech or something that comes out of Houston that's so ubiquitous in everyone's life that you, you just don't even know it's there. And you can, but you know what comes from Houston, what came from Houston. Commercial space station, you know, or like you know, quantum chemical reactors or something might do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs>